Hi, welcome to the Noise Path. In this episode, we're going to try another repair. What I have here is a Stanford Research Model SR650, which is a two-channel filter. These two channels are completely independent of each other, and you can configure the gain and cutoff frequencies as you see fit. Now, this one is configured as a high-pass and a low-pass. So you can imagine that if you cascade them, you can get a fully configured bandpass filter. You can have two separate ones, of course. You can also get them in a low-pass, low-pass configuration. In that case, if you cascade them, you'll get a much sharper roll-off. And of course, other combinations are possible. Now, because you can control the bandwidth and the gain independently, you can create some really interesting filter responses. Unfortunately, this unit is faulty. Let me see what happens when it turns on. Here we go. We get a nice Christmas tree lighting, but unfortunately nothing else happens. And no matter how long you wait, it's always going to be stuck in this situation. So we're going to definitely have to take a look inside and see what's going on with it. I really do want to fix this because this instrument sitting in front of, for example, a lock and amplifier can be quite helpful in reducing noise and also very good for various audio applications as well. So let's take a look inside. And here's inside of the unit. It's really nice and clean, and it clearly has two completely independent filter channels. This is the high pass, and this is the low pass. Now, of course, when you want to make a tunable filter of some kind, the high pass and the low pass are going to require essentially the same kind of circuitry with some minor modifications on where you put the capacitors and the resistors. That's why they look essentially identical, just minor changes in the configuration. We don't have an interface for each one. This is the only interface to this main board, so it's clearly controlling with some uh, custom serial interface between the two of them. The display and the front buttons are all controlled up here. So that's where the main processor is. I think the main processor is this one. And then we do have a couple of other ICs, perhaps some memory, some EEPROM there. And here's the main power supply section coming in and some rectifiers and so on. So it's very well divided. Power supply, digital, filter with isolations between them. Really nice classic Stanford Research design. Now we need to dig in a little bit further in, see what's going on. Given that all the lights turn on, and it's just no activity, I am somewhat skeptical that the problem is here because even if I unplug this, I get exactly the same behavior. So it can't be from the filter. It has to be something going on in the digital section. So we have to dig in a little bit further in here. Okay, so let's use the Tektronix 4 series, which is a fantastic oscilloscope. We also have spectrum view. I've done reviews and teardowns of this instrument on my channel. Let's see if you see any activity in the digital section at all. So here's the processor. I'm just gonna probe a couple of pins randomly. It's sitting high. Let's try some more. That's high. That's also high. Another one that's high. Go to the memory. Nope. No activity at all. Nothing there. Beginning, nothing there. The power supplies are all there. This one is low. This one is high. So I looked around everywhere. I couldn't find any activity. So there's no potentially no clocking happening or something has gone wrong with the processor. So I think we should look at the schematic a little bit and understand how the clocking is generated because there's a bunch of circuitry around here. And here's the schematic. And thanks to Stanford Research for making it publicly available. It certainly makes it a lot easier to repair these kind of instruments. So here's our main processor, the Z80, and it's sharing the bus with three other ICs and they're probably the memories and so on that we were observing earlier. One of them does have a battery backup with the diodes to protect it from the main supply. And this is probably some kind of SRAM, maybe for settings and so on. But regardless, I see no activity anywhere in any of these pins and so on. So something is certainly going on. There should be some kind of activity. Now, if you go over here, we can actually discover where the clock is coming from. So here's the clock of the main processor, and it's coming from this circuit right over here, which is nothing unusual. We do have a 74,000 inverter, which is wrapped around the crystal here. And this is going to create the unstable circuit, which is going to oscillate at the 3.68 megahertz that is desired. We do also have a 1 mega ohm resistor ensuring this thing actually starts up. Now the power supply over here is also filtered, which is nice to see. It prevents kickback from this into the actual instrument because you don't want this clock, which is a large signal, square wave to go back. There's also some NAND over here, which is gated by something else. Up here, some flip-flop, but regardless, it doesn't matter. And there's no activity anywhere here, so there must be something going on. So it's a good lead to check this part of the circuit, basically checking this pin. And I already checked this one. There was nothing here anyway. I mean, you could argue that this, for example, could be bad, which is also possible. But at least we can start from here, pin 2 of the ICU3. That's pretty easy to get to. And yeah, nothing else unusual going on. There's a lot of spares gate spares of this one, they're clearly only using one of them. So if this is dead, we could always replace one of the other ones. But it's unlikely that if one of them is dead, the other ones are still okay. So nonetheless, let's go and take a look and see what happens. So back to this here, here's where pin number two, 
and it's just sitting high. So I'm reasonably convinced that there is nothing coming out of the clock generator. Now there is something a bit unusual here. If you notice, that chip is the only chip that's on a socket. Right, so I wonder why that is. Is this a common problem with this, or did somebody else already work on this? So it's unusual to see that, because everywhere else, everything else, I mean, these, these, these two chips are, of course, on a socket, too, because they have to be programmed and so on. But this one is an unusual one. Perhaps this is a common failure point of these units. Okay, I went ahead and I replaced it, which was really easy to do, because it's socketed. Now, ironically, this is the newest part in this entire instrument, because it's vintage 2012 that I found somewhere in my parts bin of 74,000 Logic. Let's go ahead and try this again, see if you see any difference. Turn the unit on, find pin number two. Here it is, aha, and take a look at this. There we go, we do have our clock. And if you look at the bottom of the clock, there's some random activity that's promising. It means there's some other activity inside, digital activity that's injecting noise into this. So yeah, it looks, looks pretty promising. Let's take a look now. But unfortunately, that has not fixed the problem. It's actually made the problem different. So now when I turn it on, we lost our Christmas tree. So everything is now completely dark. I get nothing else. So obviously there must be another problem and that wasn't the only one. And it's consistent that perhaps somebody has worked on this and this is one of the reasons why that thing was already socketed. Well, you guys must have been screaming at me through the screen. There is a missing part here. This component is not populated. It should be there because if you remember, there were three parts on the digital bus of the processor and this is not there. And I believe this is the SRAM. I have to check to see if I have one of these. I have a whole bunch of these SRAMs because they were also quite commonly used. Let me see if I can find one. Well, unfortunately, I didn't have one immediately, so I had to take out of a different instrument one just so we could try this one. This is now vintage 95, so it's older than everything else that's in here, but it hopefully should tell us if this would fix the problem. All right, one more try. Ah, there we go. This is much, much better. Beautiful. Look at that. Five killers, five killers. This probably went to its default settings because that SRAM was holding the previous setting. So it's basically now reset back to zero and it is functional. So let's take a look and see if it actually works and if it does any filtering as it's supposed to. Now, because of some of the strange things I saw inside, I thought let's sweep over it one more time before I start testing it. And I noticed something unusual. I actually just also noticed that this is crooked, but I think that's just the way it's been soldered from factory. But if you look over here, Look at that. You see this? This capacitor, one of its legs is just floating in the air. It should look like this, but this one is floating. Now you could say that maybe this was disconnected. But on the other channel, in exactly the same location, we have exactly the same thing. Look at that. Floating leg. So why has somebody changed this? Is this something that was done in the factory or whoever was fiddling with this before has done this? Hmm. So let's walk through the circuit and see if we can find that capacitor that has been modified. So here are the two inputs of the instrument, A and B. We do have the selection so that you can either ground one port or let the, essentially the signal becoming differential or single-ended. AC-DC coupling here, these are done with relays. And then we have an attenuation here which is done through an active circuitry, which is interesting itself. It does have some limitation in terms of linearity, but you can get some good attenuation without affecting the input impedance at all. And then you do have here the selection for the attenuation. Now this is a pretty important sub-block, differential fed amplifier, which is the low noise portion of the circuit. Pretty important to get this thing balanced out, so there is some offset cancellation circuitry built into it. And then we have a differential to single ended conversion, which brings it all the way back to just a single input at this point. And then going down over here, we have a resistive divider, which is an attenuation. So by using yet again another set of switches, these are now solid state switches, you can control the gain. So you either feed the signal directly or you feed it after the resistive divider. And then we come into U6, and that's the place where that modification has been made. And if you look carefully, a lot of the capacitors are just labeled as C. Like this is C, this is C, these are just filters on the power supply. But this one is labeled RC, and I think these are the modifications that have been made later by placing these capacitors directly across some resistor. And if you look at the architecture of this sub-block, this is nothing more than a non-inverting amplifier. This has the feedback resistor 909 ohms, and the resistor to ground is 100. So the gain of this amplifier is just simply 1 plus R2 over R1, so it gives you a gain of about 10, which is 20 dB. Now by placing this capacitor in parallel to this feedback resistor, you create an integrator, and that integrator is going to have some cutoff frequency. Now if you calculate the cutoff frequency of this, it's about 1.4 MHz, which is way, way above the frequency operation of this system in the first place. So they likely just add this to get rid of high frequency noise. You can see it done again here. 
in the stage that follows it after some attenuation control again, a grain control here. So I don't know why they've removed this. I'm not sure. I'm just going to basically revert it back and bring it back to the way it was. I'm assuming that the factory wanted it that way. And then the signals then follow to the next stages where the actual controllable filtering happens. Now, when it comes to the filters themselves, as long as you're not using inductors, there are really only a few ways you can adjust the poles and zeros of the filter. You have to adjust the value of the resistor, you have to adjust the value of the capacitor, and you can play with some of the loop parameters by adjusting things in feedback. So here, you can see a whole bunch of selectable resistors. For example, here, we have a whole bunch more here, and you can tune them also in a continuous way in some situations. Here's the variable capacitor that you can select in between, and then there is a DAC over here, which is in the feedback of this amplifier path, which allows you to fine-tune the different poles and zeros of the filter response. And this is essentially for calibration purposes. So in terms of architecture, there's a lot of analog art that goes in here, but ultimately you're just changing some parameters in the loop. The fact that they get the continuous tuning along the entire band is primarily a function of a combination of these things, because otherwise switching discrete components will give you discrete steps. But overall, this is a really nice unit. So I think I'm fairly satisfied with how this works, at least in the front end. So I'm going to go ahead and revert this change. So I did solder those capacitors back down. I was setting up to do some measurements and recording, and I noticed that everything was getting a little bit dim. So I opened the instrument up, and I took some thermal images, which I'm going to put on the screen right now. And while I was doing that, the whole instrument just completely died. As you can see from the thermal images, the temperature of some of these components is really high, probably much too high for this thing to be in normal operation. So what I did was that I went back and I disconnected everything, disconnected the analog boards, disconnected all the connectors that go to the front panel. So the only thing that's right now should be on is just this digital section, and it's really not that much stuff under. So first thing is that this has a few different power supply planes. It has two independent plus and minus 15 volts, which go into these two boards, and it does have a 5 volt regulator, which runs, of course, everything else over here. So the input to the 5 volt regulator is supposed to be at 9 volt DC, and it's going to regulate that down to 5 volts. But if I measure the input to it, if you look on the left side, see it's at 13 volts. So that's quite a bit higher than it should be, and I don't think anything's coming out of it anymore. I think the 5 volt regulator actually died. But let me try again. It might have gone into a thermal runaway. I go to the output here. No, there's nothing coming out. And if I measure any of these ICs, you'll see that there's nothing. No, so that regular is definitely toast. So something happened there. So let's go and remove that rectifier just to see if that is perhaps some fault in it. And then we're going to also have to replace this 5 volt regulator. So I made a few modifications. First, I measured the full bridge rectifier that was inside the instrument. Now it certainly was rectifying, but it does have a very large forward bias voltage of about 0.6 volts, which means that it has a very high dissipation under load. So I just said forget about this one. I removed it and I replaced it with a significantly better full bridge rectifier with only 0.17 volt forward bias voltage. And this one is now mounted to the chassis of the instrument, which means that it's going to have a better thermal behavior. It's just wired up to the same place. So there's nothing there that there usually used to be. The second thing is that the 5 volt regulator was definitely dead, so I got rid of it, and that's this one over here. Now the way they were connecting the 5 volt regulator to this heatsink body was using this pad, and it has completely dried up, so it was not making a very good thermal connection. As a result, this was running very, very hot. So I removed it completely, put some thermal paste, really good thermal paste there, and the reason I could do that and not use this isolation pad was because the body of the regulator and the heat sinks were both grounded. This is not always the case, so you have to be careful with that. Now these other regulators, the plus and minus 15 volt one, they still get pretty hot, get about 65 degrees Celsius, but this was reaching 85, 90 before it died. So yeah, certainly an improvement. And these guys are in front of the airflow once they cover it up, so they should be uh, running a little bit better. But these changes hopefully now finally fix the instrument. Hopefully we can do some measurements now. So I'm going to use the Quant Asylum QA403 audio analyzer to perform some frequency response analysis of the SR650. I've done a full teardown and review of the QA403 in one of the previous episodes. Definitely check it out. It's a really interesting and capable unit. So the output of this is taken and fed into a channel of the high pass filter. At the same time, the output of that high pass filter is fed into the A input of the low pass filter. And the output of that is then taken back into the quant asylum. Essentially, we have a cascade of two filters. Now, each of these filters are independently can be operated we can put them in and out of system. So if you put them out, essentially you have a through line, so none of the frequency response is applied, but the gain is applied. And we have two different kinds of gain. You have input gain and output gain. It can go up to 60 dB at the input and 20 dB at the output, so 80 dB of gain in total. You can do the same thing here. So you could have 160 dB of gain in a row. Of course, that would never work because you'll be noise limited at that point. 
But having said that, if you enable any of these filters, then of course this number, here's the high pass filter cutoff frequency, and over here we have the low pass filter cutoff frequency. You can have each of these inputs AC or DC coupled. And that's it. So we can play with all these numbers and see all kind of interesting filter shapes. And here we are in the software of the QA403, and we're looking at the output of the instrument with absolutely no signal applied. We see a few tones, but they're very, very small, close to minus 100 dB volt, and this is 60 Hz, and all the interference from power lines being picked up by everything. So I'm going to apply an exponential chirp to the input that would allow us to measure the frequency response of the system. I have a live webcam view right over here, so we can see all the settings. And as you can see, both of the filters are not disabled. So we basically have a 0 dB gain. We expect a completely flat line. Now this instrument over here, this does have bandwidth up to 100 kHz, but the QA403 can only measure up to 20 kHz. But that's going to be good enough for our first experiment. So let's go ahead and enable the frequency response. There you go, and as soon as we enable it, we see a completely flat line because we are applying a signal at minus 40 dB volt, and that's because I don't want to compress anything when we have additional gain. And look, it's completely flat, and we're reading about minus 40 dB volt here from the cursors. That means that the system is doing exactly what it's expected to do. Now I can add gain to it. We have multiple places we can add gain. We can add gain the first stage of the input of the filter. And look at that, it went up by 10 dB. That's exactly what it should do. We can add another 10 dB gain here goes up by another 10 dB, one more here from the low pass, and one more here again. There you go. You can see they all seem to work. Of course, there are a lot more combinations here. We're not exercising all of them, but it should be good enough to see that it is working. And now we're at 0 dB volts at the output. When we're applying minus 40, we have 40 dB of gain, which is correct. Now we can go ahead and enable one of the filters. For example, let's try and enable the low pass filter. It's set to 5 kHz right over here. It's not enabled yet. I can go ahead and enable it, and as soon as I do that, there you go, we should see a complete low pass. And don't be fooled by this other yellow line that's actually coming from the cursors. They should really change the color of the cursor so that it's not so confusing. But look at this sharp drop. It's really quite good. Let's measure the 3 dB bandwidth here. So we're looking at this delta until it hits 3 dB. Going very close to it, as close as I can. There it is, it's exactly 3 dB. And look at that. What is the frequency sitting at 2? So we're sitting at 5.4 kilohertz, which is very close to what it's supposed to be. This is again the 3 dB drop, that's where it's place, placing the poles. And we can disable that, it goes back up. Now we can do the opposite. This is a high pass one, we can put that in circuit. Here's the high pass, and look, it does exactly the opposite. Now we do see a kind of a lot of tones over here that I think is being amplified by the front end there. It is, again, this is 60 hertz and everything. That's a little bit unfortunate, it picks up so much noise, but Look at that, it's doing exactly what it should. Now if I enable both of them, they're exactly on top of each other, so we should see only a little bit. Look at that. Here's our band pass. Very nice. Now I can lower the frequency of the, let's say, the high pass over here with this. And press enter. Let's see. Look at that. Ah, oh, that's beautiful. Look how nice it is. There's no ripple at all in the pass band. It's very beautifully done. Let's see. Let's go a little bit further down here. And that line works really nice. I mean, there's a lot more measurements here to do, of course. We can go through many, many combinations, but I'm generally satisfied that it does indeed work. Now, if I go all the way back down here, let's go to a much lower frequency. Let's see what it does. Yeah, it, it works, and it's very flat in there. And um, it's unfortunate that we're picking this up. There must be a way to get rid of this. I'm sharing the grounds and everything, but we're still picking so much noise. Probably you should run this from an, an AC filter. It's one of those things I need to get for the lab, just so we can avoid situations like this. But I'm reasonably confident that the whole thing is working. Now, if I lower the gain over here, you can see that the entire curve goes down with it. Yeah, everything goes down, including these. So it is obvious that these are being amplified by the internal filters. But yeah, it looks good. And there you have it. The repair certainly went a lot longer than I was anticipating. And if you have one of these, it might be worthwhile opening it and checking those thermal behavior of those components so that the same thing doesn't happen to yours, especially if it's been idle for a very long time. Let me know what you think in the comment section of this repair and what else you would like to see with this instrument. I'm sure we'll use it in future repairs. And thanks to my PayPal and Patreon supporters, you really make all of these things possible. I'll see you next time.